We are now turning to Israel, to the University of Haifa. We are going to have a panel on truth or dare, journalism in the age of fake news. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the Around the World conference, uh, to the panel on uh, truth or dare, journalism in the age of fake news. It's hosted by the Kuhl Institute at the University of Alberta. I'm Roy Davidson. I'm a senior lecturer in communication at the University of Haifa. I'll be the moderator for this panel. Um, I'm joined by two colleagues. On the line is Dr. Noah Lavi. Dr. Lavi is a member of the Political Communication Unit at the Academic College of Tel Aviv Yafo uh, in Israel. She studies the areas of media, culture, and globalization. And here with us in the classroom is uh, Dr. Owen Myers. Dr. Myers is a member of the Department of Communication at the University of Haifa. He studies uh, uh, Focus, his research focuses on uh, journalistic practices and values, collective memory, and popular culture. I'll start with a brief uh, introductory remark. Uh, for the better part of the 20th century, journalists in many countries, including Israel and the US and Canada, were part of a relatively cohesive elite of news producers. Given the huge costs involved in producing and disseminating news, these lucky few journalists were surrounded by high barriers of entry that made it very difficult for new entrants to participate in news production. At the same time, journalists had little idea who their audience was. As Herbert Gans noted in, the classic, in his classic 1970s ethnography, elite journalists essentially wrote for themselves, their colleagues, and their family. Uh, this state of affairs has changed. While in many countries, fewer journalists are employed full-time, news organizations have proliferated. Moreover, while not necessarily accurate representations of audience behavior, the proliferation of digital audience metrics in the last decade in, on Google Analytics and other, uh, and other uh, platforms has changed the incentive structure journalists and news organizations face. They are now surrounded by digital indicators of the audience's preferences and opinions. Parts of the traditional news industry and some new entrants have evolved at the cost of accuracy or truth altogether. However, we shouldn't assume that these debates about the veracity of news coverage are new. In the 1830s in New York City, news organizations targeting a mass audience first appeared in the form of penny newspapers. As Donald Brazil notes in a 2005 article, these ultra-cheap newspapers subsisted almost solely on advertising. They were known, as I said, as the penny press. They attracted a mass audience through a heavy dose of soft news, crime, gossip, and a famous series of exclusive fabricated images from the moon of winged creatures. So, in a sense, as we academics love to say, nothing is new. So, but I do believe that it is within the, this changing contemporary institutional landscape uh, and the uh, resurgence of debates about journalism and truth that we need to understand the discourses and practices related to fake news. And so my first question is to you, Noah. Um, why is the term post-truth so popular? Does, it, does its popularity reflect novel developments in the relationship between government and the media? It's going to be a bit long, but I'm, I'm going to get to my answer eventually. So, so post-truth, as I believe, as I believe everyone remembers that post-truth was elected to word of the year by the Oxford Dictionary in 2016. It seems that all of a sudden, everyone was talking about post-truth and fake news vis-a-vis -vis the election of Donald Trump in the United States. I think that the term post-truth is somewhat of a trend, and maybe also a trend in decline. I want to show you a graph which one of my students um, uh, one of my students uh, sent to me recently. This graph shows the trending, uh, the trend, the popularity of the search after the term post-truth. And it peaked around the week after the election in the United States. So we understand that, and then it declined, rapidly declined, and if you can see that today, or around the end of April, uh, the search for post-truth was, uh, um, was um, actually very low. Talking about uh, post
Rose Truth uh, was new and sexy about a year ago. Since then, the media has turned to other issues. As I see it, there was always a tension between truth and politics and a tension between the media and governments. One of the definitions that the Oxford Dictionary gives for post-truth is that post-truth era means that politics today is reigned by emotions rather than facts, that the public is affected by emotions and charisma and not facts. This is actually not new. It is almost also common knowledge to say that politicians lie uh, for, as a profession, and they have always lied. There is nothing new in that. Politicians always were afraid of facts and tried, together with their media consultants, to make facts sound like opinions. It seemed like Donald Trump is the master of this strategy, but we also have good examples for that in Israel. As for fake news, for years politicians were afraid of journalists and their ability to reveal facts. However, that what seems like a new development is the ability of politicians today to become somewhat of journalists themselves via their Twitter and Facebook accounts. This is how they turn journalists' facts into opinions easily. Post truth, to sum up, is so popular because it is everywhere. We lie on our social accounts all the time, looking happy and successful all the time, knowing that we live in a post-truth culture made the term so popular, and we also agree that politicians lie all the time because we lie all the time, and it's also okay that journalists lie all the time. So it is becoming less and less interesting as time goes by, and I think that we academics are always a bit behind you know, the public but it's less interested in post-truth, but this is the, the time where we start talking about it and writing about it. I hope you understood uh, my direction. Thanks, Noah. Uh, so, a second question is uh, for Oren. And so, uh, what is truth according to journalists? Who, who lies in the news and why? And how, how do journalists distinguish between truth and lies, what do journalists do once they locate a lie in their reporting? Okay, uh, thanks for the question. First, to, just to continue what Noah said regarding truth and lie, and so I just saw a really great piece that said that um, journalists are not as, as good as talk show hosts in, 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 in managing to decipher the inner works of, of Donald Trump because Journalists are so keen on actually finding lies and, fi and, and discerning between the truth and the lie. And they're so invested in saying this and this and is not true that they kind of lose the big picture while comedians like, you know, Samantha B or, you know, Trevor Noah or, or the talk show host, they, they just, they, they do not have any expectations of Trump to say the truth and they just look at it as entertainment. And to, and to some extent, they are far better kind of, they have far better, um, equipment to deal with a phenomena such as Trump. But ju just to, to get back to your question, um, uh, journalism is highly invested in, in its own narrative of journalists telling the truth because journalism is part of the great modernist project, right? Of, of this scientific inquiry of truth and evidence. And so journalists are, associating themselves with the social sciences, have been associating themselves with the social sciences and with the hard sciences since, let's say, the second half of the 19th century. Now, um, as Noah accurately said, um, we lie, I mean, everybody lies besides the academics. I mean, everybody lies all the time. And journalists are invested in narrating the truth. Now, of course, they can never, um, they can never check fact everything that they publish. And, and Tuchman, who you've, I think, you know, you've talked about Gantz. So Tuchman, who's the second famous uh, news ethnographer from the 70s, she famously talked about the web of facticity. She talked about the, the notion of a web of facticity and all of the facts kind of interconnected. So they say Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his wife Sarah uh, came to, to a party's members, uh, his son Bar Mitzvah yesterday, and brought a gift. And so, okay. So 
let's say it's published in the newspaper. No one is going to go and check if Sal Netanyahu and Benjamin Netanyahu, or for this matter, Donald Trump and Melania Trump, are actually married, right? It's, it's, it's taken for granted they have a marriage certificate. Um, it is assumed that if somebody reports that they came to the bar mitzvah, they actually went there and so on. So, so she talks about the fact that you know, in a, in a commonsensical way, journalists cannot check everything. And they have to make those, those um, heuristics in which they choose what facts need to be verified and others could be taken truth value, and face value, sorry. And so the most important component here, and I've been talking about this with my students, I constantly, na constantly nag them about that, and our students are here, but you just can't see them. Um, they're be beyond the camera. Um, is that sources have a major, major part in, in enabling the journalists to say about something that it is true. And actually, in many cases, they, they have a major they have a major task in actually enabling the student, um, the students, the journalists to say this is happening because there are all kinds of interesting examples in which all kinds of things happened in front of the very eyes of the journalists. And until sources said, no, this is what's happening, they totally ignore it, ignored it. So just to, to quickly talk about different t types of lie that exist in journalism, there are the incredible cases in which journalists are the ones doing the lying. Um, if you have any recollection of cases such as uh, Janet Cook and Jason Blair and, and Stephen Glass, and those are journalists who um, just put, I, can you say online, pull out a, pull out of out of their asses just to just I've just did so they 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 just they just totally invented stories that had no bearing in reality because of, of all kind of problems and once those were found their news organizations went into enormous enormous um, efforts into finding every lie they told and you know extra communicating them just throwing them off the island What's interesting is that in many other cases, it's the smaller lies that are more um, beneficial for understanding the problems and pitfalls of journalism. So to give just one example, um, there are examples in Israel of cases in which interviewees it just made like total fabrications. To like there was this famous singer who, who, who posed himself as someone who is totally covered head to toe uh, with, because he was to totally burned in some kind of a fire and he's now singing those very, very sad songs, depressing songs, and he was called the burnt person, Hasaruf. And he managed to make his way into you know, primetime journalism just because news journalists were so eager to publish this newspaper, this story about this amazing um, singer who's all burnt. And because none of them was actually um, um, in acquaintance with the social background from which this singer supposedly came. So, so in, ma in many cases, the willing of journalists to publish total fabrications, it's not only just Necessary doesn't tell us that they're you know that they're it is so easy to fool them. It just tells us something about their assumptions, about their their like black holes and their knowledge that they're willing. It's like in Israel because the mainstream journalism is mostly Jewish, secular of Ashkenazi, which is to say European descent. Whenever there's a story involving people of other origins or other backgrounds, journalists will buy all kinds of stuff because it is so far away from their background, which, which I assume will be the same in, in the States. Journalists from you know, either the West Coast or the East Coast buying stories about you know, places they're not acquainted with. And just to finish this point, the, the lies that are so more common in journalism are those conventional lies by which um, the Ministry of Finance saying we're not going to deflate the value of the shekel or the dollar. I'm, we're not going to do this. We're not going to cut the budget. And of course, a month, a month passes, and of course he deflates the value of the dollar. Or, you know, of course he cuts the budget. And, and he lied when he said that. But no one no one thinks that should disqualify him from being the minister of, sci um, not science, of finance 
A, because it is assumed it is part of his job. B, because he has so much power as a, as a, um, as a source over the journalists that you know they cannot do the work without quoting the Minister of Finance. He can do his work without, without relying on them. So those are the lies that matter. OK, thanks, Owen. Uh, I'll, I'll ask a follow-up question. Uh, the, so uh, Yes. I, I feel that like there was an elephant in the room while Owen was speaking because I was laughing and you were heading towards there talking about the burn person, uh, Hasaruf, uh, right. um article. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the fact that journalists stopped checking their sources uh, vigorously was uh, was uh, was because of uh, rating uh, rating in uh, capitalism. Yes. And I think uh, this elephant uh, is in the room, and we should uh, address uh, address it, address the elephant, talk about it. Right. So talking a bit more about the elephant, right. uh, <laughs> and, and kind of a, in a follow up to both of your remarks, I. Um, but, uh, well, Okay, thanks, thanks. I'm, I'm a newbie here. Uh, so, so I was just on the way here in the morning. I was listening to this podcast by 538, this uh, relatively new data journalism uh, uh, news organization, mostly working online. And they had this podcast with their chief editor, uh, the famous Nate Silver, who, who made his name in, uh, in, in, in predicting based on uh, an averaging of surveys like uh, election results in the US. So anyway, one of the reporters there said she was actually pretty happy with what was happening with the political reporter reporting in, 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 in the US that after a few week, weeks of total uh, shock uh, after the election, the news, the, some of the news journalists uh, had stopped reporting about every uh, um, every pseudo event that the uh, Trump administration was putting out, and so I, I, I'm asking myself, and, and she and she she noted this concept and even defined it ra rather well, noting it was the, uh, uh, coined by Daniel Burstein and referring to all these official events concocted purely for the consumption of the news and through it of the public, and so is that part of I mean. Uh, a long-standing sin of, 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 of the news media, of journalists, of paying too much atten attention to artificial, artificially constructed events, partially because they're really cheap to cover. They're an information subsidy, and it's easy to cover them, harder to put feet on the ground, as it were. So but for both of you. No, do you want to answer? No, do you want to answer? Uh, maybe you, you think so. I, okay, yeah. so. So, so yes, I mean, uh, I mean to um, uh, it, we so we're just t talking class about that. There's an assumption, this romantic assumption, that there are events in the world, and those events, according to you know newsworthiness criteria, such as those those determined by Galtung and Ruge and other people who, who came after them and replicated the study. So the assumption is that there are events in the world, you know, an earthquake, and if they're newsworthy enough, they're going to be covered. But you know, honestly, because so many of the players who are trying to get the attention of the news media are so you know they're so um, they have such so much expertise in manufacturing those events, and because the relations between the journalists and those players are usually ongoing, and they have their you know they have their their dynamic, their inner dynamic. Journalists, to some extent, it is so hard for them to kind of raise up their hand, uh, their heads, and to say, "Wait a minute!" Although this is something that is orchestrated by the minister of finance, uh, finance, the chief of police, or the president, I'm not going to cover it. This is not a real event. This is not news. But you know, the criterions. And again, the economic pressures and also the competition between the news organizations, all of these have you know, accelerated to such an extent throughout the, yes. Sorry for a second, also uh, the turn of the, the, the press into, the, into uh, the internet. They need to, to manufacture yes. news also. 
Yes, yes, yes. You remember, we're not, no longer talking about the news cycle, as famously coined by, I don't remember who, we're talking about the news cyclone now. So there's, there's no deadline. There's, there's an infinite, you know, there's an ongoing deadline. So all of this kind of, um, it's like an illness, and the journalistic vaccinations are not as effective as they used to be. And, and specifically because of that, and again, I'm not very original in saying that, Trump may be both the illness and the cure. Because to, to a large extent, Trump is, is, is um, making the journalist, is, is, is uh, making the journalist make, the, it forces them to make decisions. It forces them to do stuff they kind of forgot to do and to choose sides in a way they were not accustomed to do throughout the last few decades. And also there are more, you know, they're, they're selling now more subscriptions to many, many news organizations, to the more serious ones. No, I would. Yeah. In a way, I, I just want to add something. In a way, I think, uh, being optimistic, I think that Trump could say, could be the big savior of journalism. Because I promise you I'm going to address Hannah Arendt. <laughs> uh, and, and Hannah Arendt uh, uh, wrote uh, around 1967 that uh, uh, journalism has to be pure, um, pure facts, not, not opinions. And the minute that uh, uh, Trump diminishes all journali journalism, they have to stick to the truth, to the facts, and this is the only way to uh, maybe uh, save journalism as a whole. So. Wait a minute, but ju just to counter this one, a, it's interesting that Hannah Arendt is the one who said that. Um, Hannah Arendt was a famous uh, philosopher who wrote her, you know, she was very famous, but maybe her most famous work was a journalistic work, which was a series of articles she wrote for the New Yorker about the Eichmann trial that took place here in Jerusalem. And you can say a lot of things about this book and the series of articles. Objectivist was, <laughs> you know, was, <laughs> n own, you know, what she did is the opposite. 1967. Right. In the New Yorker, it was a piece in the New Yorker. Right. But, uh, actually right. But 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 this, the thing I want to say about journalism is that actually, and in, in there's a, an analogy here drawn by um, Barbie Zelitzer, who's a famous journalism reporter, and her she wrote an early writing, a scholar. A, did I say reporter? She was also a reporter, a, but she's a famous journalism scholar, and and. A, almost 20 or more years ago, she talked about why most of American journalism failed in covering McCarthyism and the Red Scare during the 50s. And she said that journalists at that time had an idea that they have to be objective and each story has two sides and you know maybe maybe a McCarthy is making those huge, you know, those, those crazy allegations that cannot be substantiated and are not truthful, but there are two sides to each story and you need to hear both McCarthy and his opponents. And, and actually, unlike the common myth, it is not the j journalism in Edward Morrow that caused the downfall of McCarthyism, but rather, rather um, uneasiness within the American, American institutions. And so moving fast forward to Trump, um, actually, in order for journalists to cover Trump, they need to abandon their notion of objectivity and that each story has two sides. There are some cases in which stories have four or five sides, and there are some cases in which stories has just one side, and it's the side of the truth. They need to stick to the facts. Right, right. Okay, so, yeah, so I, I, I wanna, so we've been kind of uh, bad-mouthing uh, journalists and as, uh, the, indirectly their owners and social networks. We'll return to the social networks at the end if we have some time because I have a kind of another follow-up question, but let's turn a bit to ourselves. Uh, um, wha what is the role if at all of scholars and spe specifically journalism scholars in the ongoing undermining of journalistic authorities? I mean, uh, we mean, uh, did we aid, uh, uh, even if unintentionally, uh, phenomena such as fake news and post-truth by telling our students that reality is constructed, that there is no such thing as objective reporting, etc. 
Um, are we to blame? Partially? What do you think, Noah? I had a difficulty this year uh, teaching uh, um, uh, um, the first uh, course in uh, communication, communication 101. When I uh, started teaching them about all, you know, the, uh, the, the, the way that journalism is always biased, etc., I felt that I'm betraying actually uh, my sense of, uh, you know, trying to to stick with the with the right of uh, journalists to to speak about the truth, and then I'm telling my students, well, everything is a lie, you know, and so you just have to believe Donald Trump because everything is a lie, and everything is fake news. It was very difficult, and I think that we, as scholars and teachers, we have to reflect on ourselves. I don't have the answer, but I think that part of the answer is something I tried to do recently, and I tried to um, produce a, a, a video for social. Uh, media about uh, both truth and, and facts and journalism. And I think we have to be reflective about the way that journalism is always biased. Truth is always a matter of subjectivity. Wait. But then we have, can you hear me because you were... Uh, yes. Better now. Yes? yes, better. It is always a matter of subjectivity. And the journalist is always a subject who is partially truth to himself and partially alive to others. But we have to... Um, uh, to, um, how do you say it, uh, 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 to um, protect, preserve, to preserve, to, yes, to preserve the right of the journalist to say his truth and parts of his truth, and this, I think, is what we as, uh, as teachers have to, have to do, and I think we have to go out, out, even if it's, uh, you know, if it's becoming a bit, uh, you know, politics, Doing a bit of politics outside of the academia, I think, uh, as an Israeli, I think it is high time we as educators and scholars go outside and, and just uh, tell the people that democracy is here at stake and we have to, for, for some time, you know, stop blaming uh, or saying that news is biased, but we have to protect democracy. This is what I think. J just wanted to add to that that uh, some weeks ago I gave my usual, you know, shtick, my usual talk about the demise of journalism, and I, I, I have this talk I give in, you know, various venues, and it was um, not in this institution, in a, in a college, and I gave the talk about the crisis in journalism and so on, and at the end of my talk, those were undergraduate students, and I asked them, and how many of you want to become journalists? And one of them said, now, no one. <laughs> and, and, and again, again, I don't want to put, you know, so much of the blame on us because honestly, we're not very important. Honestly, we are not. But, yeah, no one listens to us. And, and it's totally okay. But, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm just saying, I, I mean, this is, this is, we have a part in it, but also through the years, maybe too many years I've been teaching at this department, I've been having, there's the internship program. Uh, the student third year, they can join an internship. And when I started, kind of a third of them wanted to do internships in journalism. Nowadays, no one wants to do them. Now, I, part of it might be the things we say, um, but you know, they're, they're very smarter students. And there are other um, factors such as they see there's very little work in journalism and you know, salaries are, and so on and so forth. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah. I've been reading this book now. Can you all see it? Uh. It's the Stuart Crawford Effect <laughs> about essays on the real impact of fake news. And this book tells us a story how all these satire shows actually turn themselves into the real news while the fake news was the real news. And I think that it is really funny that liberals such as John Stewart and others were part of this whole propaganda against journalism in a way. In a way, this is Donald Trump's agenda that news is fake news. So if you're saying essentially if uh, John Stewart was serious about uh, correcting the news, he should have become a journalist and not remained uh, mostly a comedian. Exactly. Uh, and so you, you mentioned this genre of, of, of satire, of, of fake news on Comedy Central and other kind of channels that blurs 
the the Blair that is Blair's genres between news and and entertainment, and so another one is reality TV. And uh, um, I recently listened to another podcast. I basically just listen to podcasts. And so another one. It's better than working. Yes. Uh, well, there, there was an interview between uh, uh, David Remnick, who's the uh, editor of uh, The New Yorker, was interviewing Jeff Zucker. Jeff Zucker is now the uh, president of CNN and used to be the CEO of NBC Universal in those years when it hired this relatively, relatively well-known, but not yet a, a, a wholesale known star named, uh, named uh, Donald Trump. He hired him to, uh, to, to, to star in this new show, The Apprentice. And so uh, um, Trump grew out of reality television. He tries to argue that he grew out of uh, his successes in the real estate uh, market, but it's highly debatable that, that he was a huge success there. However, in television, in reality, he was a big success. I, I was in the US for his first season. It was great TV. It's the, ever, it was, it's been the only season I've ever watched from start to finish and was totally hooked. He's a good TV guy. And, um, and so my, my question is, um, um, the, the reality TV uh, is a genre who, who, whose authenticity has been questioned. Uh, could it be that the, the popularity of, of, of this genre has, has contributed to this blurring of truth and fake? Uh, um, does, does this, is this part of the explanation for the, the rise of, of, of fake news or of the discourse of fake news? I think it's all part of what we can call a post-truth culture. I think we've been living in a post-truth culture for the past uh, decade or so. Uh, we can also debate what is uh, the, um, the role of, um, of new media in it, okay? But uh, for most television viewers, the genre, the reality genre, uh, is, uh, is understood as a genre of editing. And we're also living in, uh, in an era of self-editing. We self-edit ourselves all the time. And as reality TV blurred the boundaries between truth and lies, because we know it's a lie, we know it's all edited, but we still watch it and believe it, and we still want to believe that the persons there are authentic, like Trump, like he was the authentic manager, maybe he can be the authentic president. So uh, I think that uh, we are, we can, we, maybe it's a better term for nowadays is, is a self-editing era, which, which, which undermines all truth, all truth. Maybe it's a better term than post-truth. Truth. It's a self-editing era. Reality TV uh, educated us how to edit, how everything is edited. We edit ourselves, you mentioned social media. We edit ourselves, all, ourselves all the time. If before, you know, we were editing ourselves uh, in person-to-person -person, uh, interaction, now we edit ourselves as celebrities. Everyone is a celebrity, everyone is a self-editor. Everyone is real and, 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 and of the news. Everyone is a journalist. And I think that reality TV is part of this whole scenario of a post-truth or maybe self-editing era. And of course, uh, it affects uh, journalism uh, for sure. And, journal and also journalists today, like the big journalists, are also celebs. They're also, you know, huge media persons. And they're concerned, let's go back to the elephant in the room, because they're celebs, they have to, to uh, make rating all the time, produce rating all the time, and then they have to just tell huge stories and maybe talk about post-truth. Also, post-truth is a huge story now in the plan. So I think it's all part of the, the same culture. So, so maybe one, yeah, one last question and then we'll turn it over to you guys. Uh, the, the, I, so you mentioned, again, the elephant in the room, the ratings monster. And so um, Oren and I have a joke. We've, we've written a bunch of articles together about journalists interviewing them here in Israel. And the joke is that when we get to the conclusion, in a conclusion, you usually have to write something that is more applied. So what are the lessons we can learn? How can we correct these, these problems in journalism, in, in the labor market? And so the joke is usually that at that stage, I turn to Oren and say, what about public journalism? What about public service broadcasting? You mentioned rating, right? And so one solution to that, it's a long-standing solution from the 1920s, since the 1920s and the BBC, is let's disconnect the market 
from journalistic production. Let's create a structure that uh, uh, publicly funds uh, the, the news journalists. There is uh, in Israel right now a big battle about the, 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 the face, the future face of, uh, publi of, of public journalism. Uh, um, or perhaps uh, 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 the end of its future. But um, is that one solution, one way of distancing uh, the ratings machine from journalists? Um, I, yes, it is a solution. I just want to, just a thought that crossed my mind, that maybe one of the reasons that academics are so pro public broadcasting is that they don't work in the free market, right? B b right, because because even private universities, you know, are nonprofits. So we work in public. Those in Israel, most of the system is a public system. But even private institutions, they're not private in the sense that they need to make money. They private in the sense, right? They're they're never they're right. They, they don't have. In the states, there are pro-profit uh, universities, but they're still a minority. So maybe we are always very uh, fond of what's familiar to us and very cautious about what's you know different from our way of seeing the world. So what I'm saying is, yes, I'm pro-public broadcasting. It's just that it is clear it is not, it is not, it cannot, it could be just one component of the solution. It cannot be. It cannot be. You know. It cannot be the the entire solution because it is clear that there is something very good. I hope that's okay to say this in the university. There's something very good in a profit incentive. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. yeah, 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 please, yeah exactly. Don't demote me. Don't take my tenure. There is. You know, money is not inherently bad, and and news organizations working to 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 competing with one another to make money is a good thing. It it needs to be caught. You know, you know, in many ways, it, it needs to be put within a structure, and the c competition needs to be monitored, and so on and so forth. But saying, you know, it's not that all public journalism is good journalism. Okay. Uh, so, I just want to add yes. one final thing to that, that I agree with Owen. There will not be any quality drama in Israel, quality television drama, without a commercial market. Because yes. when the IBA, the Israeli Broadcasting uh, uh, Association, uh, when, 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 when there was just one channel, a public channel, there was no quality drama on Israeli TV. Yes. And of course, but it did need public regulation to make it right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, okay, so, um, well, let's open it up, right? Uh, for questions, comments, responses. Um, you're invited to ask any question regarding journalism, truth, so on. You are welcome to ask the questions in English, but if you feel more comfortable to ask them in Hebrew, that's also totally okay, and we'll do the translation. If you want to address the question to me, you have to... Of course. Okay. Yes. No, 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 we're going to give them the mic. Okay. Okay. So, yes, uh, Karen, okay. So, and if you can, y they can't hear you, but they, they, they can't hear, they can't see you, but just introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Karen. I'm a student, uh, third year in communications. Uh, my question is about fake news as an industry. Can you see a a agency uh, comes in, uh, I don't know, a couple of years, so it's still here, it's already here, that pays people, people on payroll, to produce fake news. And how can those people compete with a good, poor guy, a journalist, that's trying to check the facts and to do a good job, uh, be a good journalist? How can he and his stories compete with guys that are paid for making fake news um, I, I think, uh, I think uh, people are already getting paid for fake, fake, fake news aren't they yes they are people are already, already getting paid for fake news yeah I mean w what's the solution to that it, it's true that it's it's probably cheaper to invent than to go out and report but I think once or if, if we take it for granted and that it, that that journalism 
will exist within a market economy and has to exist in a market economy, and there are even benefits in, to that, then one solution is, and some do it, like the New York Times tried to do it and at a local level. You see some organizations basically branding themselves with truth. And branding is, I mean, literally branding is when you brand a cow, right, with, uh, put a mark on it so we know it's your cow and not somebody else's cow. So they actually, in, in response to Trump, they're like branding themselves as we are in the business of truth. And if you, if you brand yourself correctly and successfully, you create value for yourself and for your audience in reporting truth. You can, you can ask for a premium. You can actually build a, build a wall, right? So you can build a, a metered wall around your, your, your internet assets and start not just selling advertising, but selling subscriptions to, to, to people. And, and the Times is making a go at it and a number of other some new, some old are making a go at, of branding themselves as being in the business of, doing, of, of reporting truth to the best of their ability. Yeah, so so um, ju just to answer Karen's, uh, to, to continue what uh, Noah and Rui said and to answer Karen's story, two things. A, there are people making money of fake news. I think we've talked about it in one of our first classes. There's this village in Macedonia there was this report about this village in Macedonia, in which you know you've heard about this story. And the youngsters, the people there, they're like um, they, they, dozens of young people making money out of inventing fake news stories, and then you know challenging back, paddling them to to uh, social media. And speaking about elephants in the room. Um, uh, yes, Karen is right. It's always it's always more expensive to try and get the truth, and and so. One of the major components here that needs to be addressed are the people in charge of social media. As long as the Facebooks of the world will continue to say that all they're doing is just technology and not journalism and content, journalism will be in a major problem. They need to step up and to and they're they're trying to do so now because most of uh, there there's you know Breitbart and you know, other venues. But most fake news streams through social media. And if the people of social media will you know, step up and assume this responsibility of trying to make a judgment of what's, you know, what's a, a, a clear out lie, um, then you know, the truth has a chance. When it's a totally level playing field, it's much easier and cheaper to produce lies, I think. I, I want to add something uh, to that. I think that one of the problems of the truth is that lies are much more interesting than the truth. Yes. Because lies have to be you know, invented and colorful, and it's uh, very difficult to undermine the, the truthness of the lies because they're so colorful. And one, uh, something else, you were talking boy, about uh, uh, the New York Times, I think, if their agenda about telling the truth as a, a strategy to fight fake news. And I think that we can uh, look at the Haaretz newspaper, which is the left wing newspaper in Israel, uh, uh, which, uh, that tries uh, first to sell, uh, um, to get to readers through the internet and Facebook. They're doing a rather good job, uh, I think. And one of their strategies is, I think, uh, hire a columnist, very um, uh, loud columnists who not necessarily talk the truth, but they make a lot of noise, like uh, Noor, uh, or others, uh, these are Israeli journalists, they make a lot of noise and they talk a lot of, uh, so they actually don't set, tell the exact truth, but they bring a lot of traffic into the newspaper, and then this traffic uh, brings more readers, and they read also the, fact, the factual news. This is another strategy, I think. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Topaz. I'm second year of uh, psychology and communication. OK. Um, well, you mainly talked about um, lies, like facts that are lies. And I'm wondering if um, there is like an article that has true facts but it's presented in a false light is it the same thing as everything you've talked about to approach it in the same way who wants to answer 
verse? Yeah, it's a very good question. Noah, you want to try to answer this one? <laughs> I'm I'll give it a shot. I mean, I think, I think there is, if, I think uh, uh, one way to think about the question is to think about this notion of framing, of news framing, and that on the one hand there might be a set of a set of facts or a set of occurrences in the world they need to be produced into an event that's a tricky tricky process and and even beyond that then there's a question of um, uh, how you frame it uh, this notion of framing you can we can think of it in terms of uh, of, of a camera right like the camera we have here in the room and and uh, and, and as a bunch of scholars including robert entman and many others have said the camera can be really close and focus just on new topaz or you can fo and then you get the sense that there are let's say 70 students in the class or we can right put a kind of a wider angle uh wider angle uh, uh on the Oh, and, and see that there are actually only um, uh, uh, t uh, t 10 or so here. And so the frame is really important. And the question is, I think, uh, uh, there are probably frames that are fairer than others. If the frame really, without telling an absolute lie, uh, um, creates through editing or self-editing, as Noah suggested, this uh, um, false understanding, then it's a problematic frame for, to use in journalism. But if it if it tries if it if it tries to 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 be kind of uh, to to echo as much as possible uh, um, uh, a generous a genuine understanding of, of of the occurrence, then I think it's a uh, it's a fair kind of uh, frame. Uh, um, I, I think it, there is a tendency now to think perhaps of not multiple opinions or, or about every fact about every occurrence, but try to. Uh, to, to include multiple frames, if possible. Uh, try to both create, uh, to, to uh, uh, focus on, uh, let's say, in a complex story on particular events, let's say recovering poverty, then we might include some anecdotes about particular uh, um, people suffering from poverty, but we'll also include in a, in a complex article uh, uh, trends about poverty in general in Israel or Canada or, or elsewhere. And so one way of, of trying to, to, to avoid this particular light is to shine different lights in, uh, in, in the same text. Hi, my name is Lama. Um, I'm in my second year psychology, so I'm not really into, I'm not really from communications, but um, I'm very interested in that. Um, you touched a bit on the um, subject of political satire. And I want to ask, um, some people would say that political satire is in a way um, the opposite of fake news, as it is, um, they take away the pretenses of um, uh, of journalism uh, and just reveal what they um, seem to what they see to be true. Um, but in a way, um, they make news more of a joke. Um, that is one big um, maybe criticism that they make light of what should be very. Um, heavy. So what, what do you say about that? Do you think um, journalists should take that model, try to, to work into it, or the other way around? What do you um, think about that? You want to try? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is an interesting question, uh, especially the part of the way satire makes news uh, and politics seem light and, uh, and not important. Um, I think journalists, it, this is my own opinion, yes, but I think journalists shouldn't uh, take uh, or, s or learn from, uh, from the sat satirical news. I think they should uh, stick to their own good uh, work uh, ethics. I think work ethics is, 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 is the answer here. And I think uh, the current uh, communicational uh, um, field uh, with the uh, uh, new media and, uh, and Facebook and everything, it works, it, it, it works under, it, it works under, uh, it's like an undercurrent under the work ethics of journalism. And I think we should stick to good old work ethics of journalism. Uh, and, and this is, I think, the answer. And they shouldn't learn from satire. By work ethics, I mean double checking and triple checking the facts 
and, uh, and, and just working hard and repeating the truth and, and, and regarding the truth as a serious, uh, a serious subject, as a ser serious issue for society and for politics. Okay, uh, so I think uh, we can wrap up. I'd like to uh, thank everybody involved, uh, thank uh, the audience, thank Noah, Oren, thanks. Bye-bye. Thank